amazing students and welcome back to another video lesson. This is pretty exciting because we are now entering the very last unit of the book. This is Unit 4, Evolution and Interdependence of Organisms, and what's great about this unit is some of the topics are ones we've already discussed, so it should be pretty easy for you to do most of the things that are coming up. Let's take a look. So in Unit 4, or Chapter 11, we're looking at the environment and change over time. So both how the Earth responds to the living things on it and what's happened over uh, pretty much the last 4.6 billion years. Incredible things like this beautiful orchid. The orchids didn't always exist. In fact, flowering plants only came into existence in the late Cretaceous period. Most of the time the dinosaurs had on the planet, there were no flowering plants. So things have changed over time, and we want to take a look at that. There, this chapter is divided into three lessons. 11.1, Fossil Evidence and Evolution. Lesson 2, Theory of Evolution by Natural Selection. And Lesson 3, Biological Evidence of Evolution. I hope you find all of these interesting. I'm excited about teaching it. I hope you're excited about learning out there somewhere comfortable where you probably have a snack and uh, hopefully you're enjoying this way of learning. So, chapter 11 has a few uh, vocabulary words. We have the fossil record, mold, cast, trace fossil, geologic, time scale, extinction, and biological evidence. Of these things, we've talked about the fossil record, we've talked about the geologic time scale. The word extinction should be familiar to you. Mold cast, trace fossil, and biological evolution should be somewhat new terms, but oh boy, have I made this PowerPoint and this lesson easy for you to do the concept map. So stay tuned till the end of this lesson. Well, actually, this is probably going to be in two parts. Lesson one will be, this is part one of lesson one, and it will be part two of lesson two, and then help on the concept map. So, I've also got, you can't see it yet, but on the table out here in front of me, I've got a whole bunch of fossils. Eventually, when we switch gears, I'll, I'll switch and show you, but that's the mastodon tooth that we looked at earlier in the year, and so we're going to talk about fossils and their importance and what they mean to us and what they mean to scientists. Well, I thought that was getting a little boring, so I've put in a clip of the fossil table. There's the mastodon tooth. It's surrounded by mastodon bones. And then this is the Florida geode. It's full of calcite crystals that crystallized under the shell as it over the years sat buried deep underground somewhere near Galaxy Skateway. So it, it's broken into three pieces, but those calcite crystals are made of calcium carbonate, the same thing limestone and most of Florida is made out of. All right, this is a challenge. Can you see the T-Rex? So our essential questions are how do fossils form, how do scientists date fossils, how are fossils evidence of biological evolution? The first vocabulary word we're going to take a close look at is the fossil record. You might already know that fossils are the remains or evidence of once living organisms. The fossil record is made up of all the fossils ever discovered on Earth. We haven't found all of the fossils that exist on Earth. But the fossil record is made up of all the ones we have found. More are being found every day, which is really exciting. It contains millions of fossils that represent thousands of species, most of which don't exist anymore today. The next thing is mold and cast. And I tend to get mold and cast confused. Even though I like jello, I get mold and cast confused. But I'll try to make it as clear as I can, maybe even do a little demonstration. So, sometimes when an organism dies, its shell 
note that I have a shell here. Here, I'll zoom in. Well, I'm not zooming in, I'm just walking up and it's kind of an ordinary shell, but it's pretty. And it's going to be a key player in understanding molds and casts today. So, when an organism dies, its shell or bone might make an impression in the mud or sand. When the sediment hardens, so does the impression. The impression of an organism is called a, in a rock is called a mold. Sediments can later fill in the mold and harden to form a cast. A cast is a fossil copy of an organism in a rock. A single organism can form both a mold and a cast, as shown in the photo here of a trilobite, where you have the, the mold and the cast. Hopefully you can, can see that. If not, do you have your books out? Did you bring your book? Is your book open in front of you? Or do you have it open online on the computer? Probably not if you're watching this on the computer. But anyway, it's there and it's a good picture and I should have made it bigger for you. But I'm getting ready to do a little demonstration of mold and cast, so maybe I'll be able to show it to you bigger in just a moment. As promised, you can now see our mold and cast of our trilobite. Sort of. It's a little bit um, difficult to see because it's a little blurrier than I'd like it to be. But, again, you can look at it in your book and there's about five million pictures like this on the internet. So, I've zoomed back a good bit because I want to try to make a mold and a cast. This will take some time, but with the magic of video, for you, there should be no time at all. So, of course, I have one of my ubiquitous Chinese food containers. I have some cornstarch and I have some water. And you know where this is going. We have played with cornstarch and water before. But in this case, I'm going to make artificial mud. I'm also going to make a mess. My, my nice, pretty lab table with all these fossils laid out are, you know, kind of a mess. Which, by the way, for those of you that uh, didn't, weren't here earlier when we did the fossil lesson, I found all these. I went out digging near Croton Road and pulled all of these out of the ground. So I'm going to add a carefully measured amount of water, and then I'm just using my fingers to mix it up. And what I want to do is get it the consistency of the, the same stuff that we made back when we did the lab. So I don't know, you probably want to see this, so I'm getting a little closer, and if I tilt it, yeah, I spilled it on the table already. So. Let's try this. I'll just pull some up and you can see that it's draining out like I have a really bad sinus infection. But what we're creating is a non-Newtonian fluid which doesn't behave like normal fluids. As you might recall, when we put pressure on it, it behaves like a solid. And when you let go of it, it flows and behaves like a liquid. And as much fun as those things are, that's not why I'm using this today. I'm going to get it all mixed up here and make a nice smooth layer of, well it's supposed to be like mud. It's still a little dry in the corner. I'm going to just add a little bit more water. That might have been too much, but hey, I can always add more cornstarch. Okay, I'll probably have to speed this up in the video because you'll get bored watching me just <laughs> make messy stuff. But it is fun. And remember, cornstarch is inexpensive. So far, there has not been a run in the grocery stores for cornstarch. And so if you combine cornstarch and water, you too can do crazy stuff like this. Now, what I'm going to do... I did make it too soupy. I'm going to take our shell of science here and I'm going to set it, and right now it's floating in the cornstarch. But I'm going to let it sit overnight and tomorrow, which for you will only be a few seconds, we'll take a look at it and hopefully I'll be able to pull it out showing you a mold and a cast.